Um, my name is Myra Blythe. Um, I'm a trustee and Joy, who's also on your screen, is the communications officer for the Mint House. Um, we're delighted to see you here today for this, the final event in the autumn programme of our network events. Today's discussion is picking up a subject that is very rarely approached in all the manifold discussions around restorative justice. And it is the relationship, if there is one, the relationship between restorative justice and spirituality. And our presenter today um, is more than qualified to help us through this question. He's given the title Mindfulness, Deep Listening and Stories, the spiritual, not religious core of restorative justice. Our speaker is Dr. Mark Umbright. Um, Mark is a professor and founding director of the Center for Restorative Justice and Peacemaking at the University of Minnesota in the School of Social Work. He serves on the faculty of the Center for Spirituality and Healing in the Academic Health Center at the University of Minnesota and teaches courses on peace building through mindfulness practice and forgiveness and healing. He also serves as a visiting professor at the Marquette University Law School in Milwaukee. As an experienced restorative practitioner, he has facilitated peace building circles and restorative dialogues um, all over the world. And we are going to be able to draw from some of that experience today as he addresses this question for us. Just before I hand over to you, Mark, I want to make, um, uh, on Joy's behalf, a few housekeeping requests for those of you who may be new indeed to the Mint House. Um, basically, we would like to invite you, um, if, you, if you are able to help us, you can do in two ways. One is you can help us to improve our approach to the sharing and the learning of restorative theory and practice by filling in, in the evaluation form um, for this event. It will not take long, a few minutes, but in the spirit of restorative principles of participation, your participation in the evaluation of the event will help us develop better in that way. You can also help us. Um, every event that we put on practically is free and we want to be in that mode, um, but every event does cost. If you are interested in supporting the work of the Mint House, just go on to the website and you will see how you can give just a small donation. That would be that would be fantastic. Finally, and most importantly, because of the UK regulations on data protection, we can't simply write to you um, with all the information about the Mint House. We need you to opt in. So if you want to be kept up to date about Mint House events, programs, and news, then go to the website again. Um, or go to just your emails and email Joy. She's putting into the chat box right now her um, address. You can get her that way, and then you can be sure to be kept up to date with the news. Those are just the three small items that I wanted to share before we get on with the business of the day. And I hand over now to you, Mark, to help us tackle this question of the relationship between RJ and spirituality. Thank you, Myra. Well, it's good to be with all of you. Uh, wish I was in person, but obviously not possible. Before I go deeper into the issue of mindfulness, deep listening and stories, and particularly sharing a video talk with you that's on YouTube, which is on taming the ego, I wanna just um, give you a little background and put all of this in context uh, of just my own journey. On the one hand, I'm about the farthest person in the world the way I grew up to be talking about this. I grew up in a moderately conservative, evangelical, Baptist, Republican family in Chicago, in a setting where I knew nothing about Eastern religions. I grew up believing there's Christians and then there's Catholics. <laughs> that kind of restricted view enormously. But it, it was some good stuff too. And I have very good memories. And I met my first Palestinian in Sunday school. And we were in the most diverse church, it still is, in Chicago. But you know, my roots, I didn't grow up in some liberal family uh, that were part of the, the radical 60s and all that. But I was called into the radical 60s as a young man with the Vietnam War. And I became, became a radical activist being involved in voter rights registration in the South, being driven out of Southern towns as an end lover, 
being pretty frightened at times. And I got into that, not because of leftist stuff, but because I took seriously the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> My conservative background as a Christian, I really believe that stuff, I still do. <laughs> and that's what drew me into that. And I witnessed the coming of prophets from the East, so to speak, gurus uh, coming into the States in the 60s, actually late 50s, 60s, early 70s, when Buddhism was really introduced into North America. And I have vivid remember memories of that and of being an absolute skeptic <clears throat> of what was happening. You know, I, the whole idea of meditation, all that, like, give me a break. You know, if you want to just tune out, go ahead, do that. But if you want to be active and involved and have an impact, let's organize. I was a community organizer. So, you know, that's um, kind of my where I came from. And in the earliest years, you know, in my 20s, even early 30s, uh, last thing I'd be talking about would be mindfulness deep listening, stories, give me a break. Who wants to hear stories? We got to get an action plan. We got to get social change movement. Now there still is a place I believe for action plans and organizing and demonstrations and direct actions, but it's not an either or. The more I have been blessed to have been invited into many countries, over 30 countries on all major continents, many tribal indigenous communities, not many, a number here in this country and a few in other countries. I have, um, it's changed the way I look at life and all this stuff. It hasn't made me feel I'm some expert that I now understand it or get it, quite the opposite. It's humbled me. It realized how the white mind is so loaded with privilege and the academic mind so pumped up with intellect that we get into these illusions that we can understand and control things. The mind is important. We only use a small fraction of it. But those exposures to other cultures that have invited me in to work at different levels, um, it's, it's really brought me deeper into what this is all about. From the earliest time of involvement in the late 70s, when Howard Zare began, my friend Howard began writing about restorative justice and I went to a number of the events and we started working together. From the moment I uh, witnessed the first VORP, Victim Offender Reconciliation Program, which was the precursor to what we now call restorative justice and victim offender dialogue or mediation, there's different references to it. I witnessed things that I couldn't put words to. It was like, wow, something's happening some kind of shift, these people who were angry. I remember this case in the, this one was in the early eighties, where the victim of a burglary, that I was the facilitator of this session, openly talked about, uh, with the guy who caused the harm, about his gun behind the door. And if he had been home, he could have ended up shooting him. And over the years, my work in many states, including Texas, which was one of the sources of my uh, sites of my uh, study on victim offender dialogue and severe violence, homicides, attempted homicides. I mean, I have videotaped interviews where they talked about how they, if they were home, they would have killed the guy. But now after having met them, they care about each other. They're not friend friends, but they care about each other in a deeper sense than a lot of friendships have. You know, I would witness this stuff and think, whoa, what's going on? And bringing this up to date, uh, the, a large amount of work I've been doing for the last few years in the wake of the largest clergy sex abuse scandal in our state, in the Archdiocese of Minneapolis and St. Paul, in the wake of massive civil, criminal, and bankruptcy litigation, restorative justice was in the settlement agreement in a specific clause that required restorative justice be engaged as part of the process of healing and accountability. And so the archdiocese has consulted with me for um, two and a half years, working with parishes and working with a small number of actual survivors of clergy sex abuse who wanted to meet the perpetrating priest, but that's not real likely because so many have passed on. 
and so many are still in denial, or at least meeting the archbishop or other officials who covered up a lot of this stuff. And again, I witnessed this stuff, incredible things. And it's only been in more recent years that I've been able to put words to this. It's what I call dealing with the energy of conflict and trauma. My, uh, of a, my different books I've written over the years, the one that's the smallest, the easiest to read. I never would have gotten tenured at a university for writing it because it's written from the heart, <laughs> not from the head. It's called Dancing with the Energy of Conflict and Trauma. Letting go, finding peace. It's a collection of real life stories a few from my own family, but mostly with people in communities I've worked with all across North America and many other countries, including some extremely violent, a terrorist involved kind of things, political violence. And I'm really uplifting their stories and what their, their strength, their courage, their wisdom and what they taught me, even though they brought me in to teach them <laughs> or facilitate or whatever. I mean, it was very circular, the energy. And uh, going deeper, and we don't have time to go into this, but you know, I've been speaking a lot and, and doing some writing and stuff on the energy of forgiveness. That's, in fact, that's one of my recent books called The Energy of Forgiveness, which goes again into all kinds of different stories and develops a conceptual framework for this too. Something I've witnessed over decades, words like, ener uh, words like forgiveness were typically not used in the encounter. Reconciliation was rarely used, sometimes. But I would be witnessing this enormous shift in the energy of those present, the voice tone, the affect, the way they're interacting, kind little gestures of, of the person who caused the devastating harm to this person, reaching for the tissue box and handing it over, pushing it over to the mother whose son he killed or in, uh, on the West Bank and the Middle East among Palestinians and Israelis who have had the courage to come together. And this is a group called the Parents Circle. Many of you, some of you might know of them, incredible group of courageous parents who have lost their loved ones from the political violence, who are fed up with their both governments, the Palestinian and Israeli governments. And they're building peace brick by brick families coming together, individuals coming together to support each other. Oftentimes, Palestinians have to engage in having to engage in civil disobedience to cross the, the wall, the line, the fence between Israel and the occupied territories. But they'll do that to meet with Israelis. And they're speaking out and have for decades now in the international community about the importance of building peace, of learning how to live with each other. So I could go on and on, but I don't have time. The I've witnessed this stuff and I feel just incredibly fortunate at a time when, I mean, some people here, some friends of mine hear some of what I'm doing and think, Mark, how can you not be depressed? Hearing all this stuff, you're dealing with so much of the dark side of human existence. And I, I tell them, well, yeah, I'm witnessing the dark side, but I'm also witnessing the light, the enormous strength and resilience and wisdom of those who have been deeply traumatized and hurt. In fact, many of the indigenous populations which my country has devastated over the years and other countries in their own ways are some of the main teachers of what I'm speaking of, not through PowerPoints, but through their presence and modeling their old ways and how to work with each other. The research I've done over the years, um, some of the earliest studies in restorative justice, the impact, and this again included four sites in Canada, uh, four sites in the US. It's, these were some of the first multi-site studies in restorative justice, two or three sites in Europe, including the UK, um, and other areas. It's taught me a lot, sort of, <laughs> You know, it's, I've been able to, this has been research in the sense of looking at the impact. This is not theoretical research. This is grounded research. Once we start applying all these wonderful concepts and ideas, what is the real earthy impact on those who receive it? 
Does it even come close to what some of the intentions are or goals? And I consistently found incredible data. In fact, in the study I did, when this victim offender dialogue was applied, face-to-face -face meetings in the worst cases imaginable, multiple homicides even, I had a hard time finding negative data. As a researcher, I look for negative data. It's called negative case analysis. We can, as practitioners, we can learn some of the best lessons from looking at what did not work. How can we change things or eliminate certain practices? And yeah, there are some incidents, I can give examples where it did not have the full impact desired, but no examples where it had exactly the opposite impact in a horrible, horrible way. And if you ask me, what has been the major impact of restorative justice in the juvenile and criminal justice system and now increasingly in workplace settings and faith communities and schools and all kinds of other settings. I'd have to say the following. It sounds overly simplistic, but I do mean it. It totally relates to what we're talking about here. Restorative practices, restorative justice, humanize rather than otherize people we are in conflict with even people who we have hatred toward. By humanizing the process, it's simply hard to hold on to hate. And we've known this through decades in, in, with soldiering even. It's hard to kill soldiers if you're looking at the people at the end of the gun barrel as a father, a mother, a son, a daughter, rather than the names we put on the enemy. And this was actually proven during God, World War I, the, uh, during trench warfare. You know, there, there's a movie made on it, books made about the Christmas peace, where soldiers in trench warfare are not far from each other, across from each other, could hear each other talking almost. One side held up a white flag and said, can we stop and have a truce? It's Christmas. Can we just come out and share some smokes, come into the land in between? And everyone was suspicious of that initially. They slowly did that, came out and related as they were all guys, young guys, sharing smokes or telling stories. And then they went back into the, the trenches. Their officers said, get back here. You got to shoot these people. You got to kill them. And when they fired their weapons, they fired high. They gave the wrong coordinates for bombs to come in, artillery. And eventually their officers had to get rid of them and get new troops in who had been recently trained on kill these bastards. They're not people, they're animals. And this went on through different parts of the Western Front. The point being, it is, simply, it is hard to hurt or kill people if we see them as human beings. I have even had murderers that I've worked with in prison who um, the surviving parent of children they killed. I remember this one individual, convicted murderer said, when I pulled the trigger, as these older people were asking to save them and offering me forgiveness even, if I had known them as people as I know their kids now, I couldn't have done it, simply could not have done it. So humanizing the process of justice is, rather than otherizing, is what it's all about. And in a, bringing this right up to this second, and I'm sure you can relate to this in your own country in a different political context, but some of the same energy. Our nation has never been div more divided. We are experiencing some of, some of the worst and far worse of what we experienced during the 1960s, during a radical time of change with the level of crime, conflict, racism, horrific stuff. And I'm part of a bipartisan citizens movement in this country that is called, was initially called Better Angels based on Abraham Lincoln's speech after the Civil War ended when the Northern states wanted to really punish the South. It's time to get even. And Lincoln gave talks on how it's, we have to appeal to the better angels in ourselves as we heal our nation. Today it's called Braver Angels, not just Better Angels. And these are little chapters all over our country, including in Minnesota, that can only begin if there's a joint leadership of someone 
who is red and blue, someone who is Republican and Democrat, someone who passionately believes in our former president and those who passionately oppose him, particularly people of color. And these folks are trained in some basic conversation and dialogue skills. Restorative justice is part of the background of the training, but it's not upfront in the language you'll hear about them. And they come together not to convince each other debate or to see eye to eye, that's a non-starter. They come together to listen to each other, to tame their minds, to identify weaknesses in their own position and perhaps strengths, however small, however few, in the other. And the impact this is having is, has just been incredible. If we had time, I could show a short video of that, but we do not have time. Where people who, it's a major shift in the energy of trauma, unbelievable. From people of color and from Muslims, and others who deeply are critical of our former president, Trump. And those, there are Americans to this date who believe he was the greatest president our country has ever experienced. Uh, that's not where I'm at, but there's a lot of good people in our country, some in my family, who believe that, even though they still remain good people in so many other ways. Again, that's a whole nother discussion. The point is when we move to from otherizing to humanizing conflict, that's when a major shift in the energy occurs. Mark, hey, a, gentle, I want to... a gentle reminder, Mark, according, yep. to your, your, according to your own plan, you probably want to be moving on to the uh, video quite soon. Yep, we're gonna do that real quick, like immediately, okay? <laughs> Let's flick into it. Well, let me just preface it by saying this, in the words of John Kabat-Zinn, mindfulness, he refers to as open-hearted, moment-by-moment, non-judgmental awareness. Mindfulness is a type of meditation that comes out of the East, but mindfulness is also a way of life. It's a way of being. Open-hearted, moment-by-moment, non-judgmental awareness. Okay, let's get right into the video. The video. And, and as we do that, I say to folks, if you have questions, remember to put them into the chat box as we make our way. As restorative justice has developed from the margins in the 1970s into the mainstream, not totally mainstream, but today restorative justice truly is a global movement in well over 67 countries as the United Nations has found. And as restorative justice has developed over all these decades, there's been more and more levels and layers of training and a lot of quote advanced training. And advanced training in restorative justice in any field typically overwhelmingly deals with learning more advanced techniques, you know, ways of doing what you're supposed to do. Well, I'm here today to offer a very different perspective on advanced training. Something I've learned over the years and learned from um, looking back and reflecting on my own limitations, as well as whatever good I've done over the years. And as I've learned from just feedback from people I've listened to. This is a very different take on advanced training. It draws upon um, bits of indigenous wisdom that I've been blessed to have been exposed to over the decades. And I wanna share with you with permission that's been given to me. One is um, a statement from an Onondaga elder from Indian country that I learned many, many years ago when he spoke of how a good chief has a good mind and a good heart. A good mind without the balance of the heart, you can become like a shark. And that's so much, so characteristic of Western culture. All up here, you're like a shark trying to ma manipulate things. Even if it's out of good intention in restorative justice, you can still be in more of that shark mode. However, a good mind without the balance of the heart, if it's all focused on just the heart, you can become ineffectual. It can be a very warm, wonderful place to be very comfortable in contemplative practice or focused on deeper healing. But you can become ineffectual. You can close yourself off to the suffering that's not just in other parts of the world, but across the street in your own city. And this Owen Daga elder spoke of how 
the good a good chief has the balance of both. We don't use the full capacity of our minds. Minds are important. But our culture, and particularly so much of our teaching and learning, is geared as just pumping more facts up here and techniques. We're learning to work with the energy of our spirit and of our heart. That's just supremely important as well. Another bit of uh, wisdom that I learned uh, many years ago, it's the core principle of native Hawaiian emotional, spiritual, and physical healing. It's called pa'akawaha. It means be still, close the mouth. And that is remarkably similar in a different cultural context for those who come from a Judeo-Christian background in the scriptures, several times where it's mentioned, be still and know I am God. Be still, feel the presence of God. So that whole notion of slowing down, taming, I could echo this in many other settings from Taoism, Buddhism, I don't have time to go into that. The point is we have been given creator-given gifts of working with our breath in silence and stillness that do not take formal Western advanced training courses, 40 hour courses, uh, long courses of other things. All of that stuff's helpful, but all of the techniques and the focus on the cognitive stuff can get in the way, frankly. For me, over the years, and this is not where I began decades ago, <laughs> but for me, all of that's important, but it's in the background. It's more important that I tame my mind, slow down, and be fully present with people. I want to highlight five key points. The first is breath work. Something we take for granted. You know, we typically, particularly in Western society, really breathe very shallow in our busyness, our nervousness, our anxiety. Learning to work with breath is powerful. The entire system of healing within Chinese culture it's called qigong. It means working with the energy of the life. And it's all focused on working with breath. And again, I could mirror this in different traditions. Within Indian country, they would use different metaphors, but there's ceremonies of the sweat lodge, vision quest, many other ceremonies. It's ways of learning to still the mind. Be present. Slow down. Feel the enormous healing energy of nature and of creation. There's many ways of working with breath. Uh, if I was with you uh, in person, I'd you know, invite you to go through some brief centering. And brief centering is not full meditation. There are many, many benefits to full meditation that have actually been scientifically shown in terms of its impact. But centering, even for a minute or two, whenever you're mindful of the fact of being nervous in a situation of public speaking or working in a with a certain group of people or an individual or in your family or with a partner, when, you get, when your buttons are getting pushed, learning to focus on breath, taking a deep breath, slow, belly breathing, feeling your diaphragm expand, breathing in to the count of eight or more because you're able to. Slowly exhale. And as the mind wanders, which it always will, focus again on breath. Or perhaps envision yourself in a beautiful place in nature that brings you peace. In traumatic situations, I've been involved in personally, where I was almost killed uh, because of an accident. Had I not worked with my breath, I would have gone into deep shock. I went into partial shock. This is when I fell down two flights of stairs in Italy. Stone stairs in the dark, and I could have easily broken my neck. And by being aware of what was happening at some level, even though I was sliding in and out of shock, uh, and clearly breath and just breathing deeply, it kept me present and alive. So, breath work is one. Second is relying on intuitive responses. Early in my career, 40 years ago or so, uh, you know, it's intuitive stuff. I like, come on, give me a break. Show me technique. I want to know how to do it. Well, that's changed a lot. Techniques, by the way, are important. What I'm speaking on is about 
going beyond technique, not instead of technique. Learning the basic techniques initially is important, but learning to move beyond them. Learning to work with the energy beneath the words, your words or the words of those you're working with. Sometimes the words we speak or the words others speak to us push our buttons and that doesn't you know, really upsets us. But if you can tune into a more intuitive posture of trying to still your mind and be open to what you're feeling, what you're sensing, even though these words sound nasty, that's not what you're feeling. You're feeling some kindness and openness beneath that. Learning to trust tuition is powerful. Third, pausing in silence in the process of facilitating any kind of restorative dialogue is extremely important. This is one of those uh, creator-given gifts that we don't need 40 hours of training <coughs> to, to engage in. Learning to work with silence. And we can only come to embrace silence and pausing if we can still our mind. Tame our egos. A fourth point, working with the energy of kind of negative energy. You know, as you're feeling this negative energy, kind of what I was just alluding to, learning to work with that. And learning to work with it means many things. And part of it is learning to trust that negative energy coming out, not blocking it, not interrupting. When you feel negative energy coming out in a circle or a dialogue uh, and you feel your buttons getting pushed and you feel this internal need that you need to intervene, you need to save this group process or this individual process, be careful. Take a few deep breaths and reflect on why am I getting so upset about this? Is this my issue or is this what's really going on? I've learned since learned, or long since learned that say in a circle process, the energy of communication can really be tense at times. But if I'm trying to feel the energy beneath the words being said, I'm really sensing that people need space. They need for you as a facilitator to pause. They need that toxic energy to, to flow out before the healing energy of story can really be engaged for all parties. And finally, the fifth point of getting out of the way. And this is a very practical thing, and I do mean getting out of the way, either emotionally or physically. Now, usually it means emotionally. Uh, you're in the middle of a victim offender conference, or victim offender dialogue, or a circle, or a family conference, and you uh, set up the process initially, you give a gentle opening statement, but you try to get people engaged directly with each other and get out of the way. I will oftentimes find myself uh, scooting back on my chair a little, so I'm not quite as directly in the energetic flow of communication. So they're telling their stories to each other or it's moving around the circle with the talking piece. And there was one case I was involved in where it literally meant physically getting out of the way. This was a homicide case. Uh, a drunk police officer at a fair, summer fair, was involved in what resulted in a, a hit and run um, death. There's a huge downpour, and everyone in the fair rushed to their cars to the parking lot. There's a long line to get out of the parking lot. This guy was drunk, he was fed up, he got in his big pickup truck and he swerved out of the line, he just tore his butt out of the parking lot right down a residential street. And within a block or two, he hit two people. One woman who was not uh, killed, but was hurt badly. And the man, her husband, was hit more directly. And he, uh, from all indications, died on the spot. This police officer, an ex-Marine who was drunk, heard it on his police radio in his pickup truck that there had been this, it got on the news immediately, he heard that this had occurred, and he just sped off to get out of there. He knew it was him. 
And when he was got home finally, he tried to kill himself with his own revolver. He was fought, he was easily identified. And I don't have time to tell the whole story, but it took many, many, many months of preparation and layers of complexity of working with two different correctional systems in different states with a county jail, trying to negotiate the preparation process and where to hold the dialogue. And when the actual dialogue was convened, it was very uh, moving. It was very uh, challenging. Up to the last moment, I didn't know how it would go. It was the angriest victim, survivor I've ever dealt with in decades. And yet I trusted my, intu my intuitive sense. Beneath words of anger and wanting to even hurt this man, like harm him verbally, I really sensed the energy of compassion and a yearning for meaning in her life. And as the session began, it was very uh, difficult. We didn't get into immediate dialogue at all. The first 45 minutes to an hour was breaking the ice. And there are, frankly, some very, if you can believe it, humorous moments in that, in a natural sense, not anyone cracking a joke. It was just things that happened, such as the lights went off in the room we're in. <laughs> and I'm facilitating this in the dark. And then I realized these are motion detector lights. And so I had to use this new kind of Tai Chi movement to get my hands going up to engage the lights to get back on. But as we got into it, almost an hour, and I, and I asked uh, uh, the woman who was harmed so deeply as a survivor, who lost her husband, if she wanted to take a break, if she needed to, because I knew she was a smoker and she would need to take a break at some point. And she said, fine. And she looked at me and said, Mark, uh, when we come together, is it okay if you just sat in the other room with my friend who came with me? Uh, I really want to meet with this man. It's a cop, a cop, and a cop wannabe. I want to meet myself with him. And my ego was, oh my God, no, I got to be here to protect these people. <laughs> and that's what I would have done decades ago. But, and that's what I was hearing up here, that's ego, intellect stuff. But my intuitive sense was this woman had a great deal of kindness and yearning for wellness. And I also obviously checked it out with the person who caused the harm, the cop and ex-Marine. And I said, are you sure you feel okay with this? We don't have to do this. We normally all come back together. Are you sure you're okay? And I asked him two or three times and reframed the question because I wanted to make sure he did not feel coerced or having to do me without me being present. So I went in the other room, sure got to know her support person. She didn't want her support person in the session. She wanted her to be there and to drive there with her. So I got to know her. And my ego wanted to have my ear up on the door like this, listening to what's going on, but I did. And about 45 minutes later, this woman whose husband was killed who was normally very kind of like this, and angry, and that kind of energy. She just walked in the room slowly and sat in the chair and just kind of whew, took a breath and let it out. And she looked at me and she said, I can't believe what I did before I came in here. My ego said, oh God, what you do? <laughs> but I didn't say that. <laughs> and she looked at me and she said, I hugged Peter. He's not the animal I thought he was. He killed my Jack, but he's not an animal. I think I want my kids to meet him. So I, there's more I could say about that and way more that we learned from that. But my point is that's what I mean. Sometimes it means physically getting out of the way. Now, most trainers in the field would never tell a facilitator to physically get out of the way. And... Uh, and I would not advise that. I'm not telling you to do it all the time, but I'm just saying, trust the strength and resilience of people. Over the years, in my personal life, family life, and in my work with highly traumatized communities and conflict zones in different parts of the world, and in many murder cases, I have learned beyond anything I could ever have conceived of the importance of honoring the strength and resilience of people who have been highly traumatized Trauma either crushes people and puts them in a bad, dark place 
and difficulty to even function. Or people find reservoirs of resilience and strength they never knew they had. Honor that. And they can teach us far more about life and its meaning than whatever we can offer them. And I'd like to add, land on that note. So good luck again on this journey. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for, for what you've shared and what we've been able to watch on, on the YouTube there, where your message is coming across very clearly about restorative justice um, having a kind of inherent spirituality, which you might describe as humanizing, um, humanizing rather than otherizing. Um, and I take the mindfulness lesson from your video as the kind of techniques that both professional facilitators might want to think about, but also individuals in ordinary life might want to be thinking about how they how they use them. Um, do we have questions that people would like to raise? If you've got access to the icon that raises your hand, perhaps we can we can see that through. I'm just flicking through what is an enormous list of people. Um, quite difficult to keep hold of everybody. So I can't actually see um, all the faces at the moment. So if you're wanting to speak, then do jump in um, and we'll try and try and pick you up. Um, I guess I can start if possible. Um, I want to ask you what might sound a bit counterintuitive given all that you said, but the idea um, that you might do something that is contrary to what we may have within a risk assessment um, sounds quite dangerous. If a risk assessment would not want to um, allow somebody with a, a heavy track record of violence to be in a room alone with somebody, would that be en encouraged or um, allowed within your judicial system? Everything I've been sharing with you would have to be a bit adapted to that reality, Myra. If um, in some, there are some jurisdictions that would not allow that because the system itself has developed such pretty tight protocol for all things, including restorative justice, and will only take the most um, minor cases and the lowest risk cases. On the other hand, um, there are, I believe it's around 37 states now in America that have formal protocol to support victim offender dialogue in crimes of severe violence. And when I first started doing these cases in the early 90s, there wasn't a single jurisdiction in the states or anywhere in the world that promoted this or allowed it. And in many of those 37 states, even though there's formal protocol, because actual practitioners oftentimes head up those programs, they'll use flexibility that the protocol doesn't suggest. For example, if a risk assessment tool raised all kinds of questions, I, if I was a facilitator, I would do extra preparation, listening to the survivor who wants to do this, going over risk and benefits, which you wanna do anyway, but giving it more and more time uh, talking about um, the possibility of unintended consequences, talking with that individual survivor about uh, the importance of a support person being there, listening to determine if the person has indicated they have a therapist or a counselor present, which many will end up saying that some won't, uh, inviting that person to be present as a support person. So there, there's ways of adjusting the way I would normally handle this versus how a tight uh, protocol and risk assessment tool might indicate. And I am not suggesting that the way I have learned to do this over the years is the way everyone should do it from start, you know, the first time they ever do cases. No, it's important to, you know, work with the techniques you've learned, be careful, risk assessment tools, give a lot of important information, 
But um, a lot of the protocol and risk assessment stuff that we have glosses over or does not honor totally the enormous strength of survivors. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating that from my experience. If, if a person whose loved one has been murdered has the inner yearning to want to meet the person who caused that harm, they have uh, indicated enormous amount of strength within themselves. And having gone, whether they had a therapist involved or not, to even get that far means they have done a lot of inner work Right. In the okay, there's a question coming up from someone by the initials of MM, which if I read from the chat box, um, says, also the restorative practice world is full of so-called experts who are involved for monetary reasons. Advanced training is one of those tricks, in my opinion. Um, does MM want to add anything to their comment? If not, maybe well, maybe your comment, Mark. Well, um, sure, I, I, I'll, add, I'll, I'll speak. Yeah. Yeah. Go on. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with Mark. Um, I think if you if you're involved in RJ or RP and you're facilitating on an ongoing basis, you end up trusting the process and you end up the, the idea of bringing people together. That's 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 where you that's where you realize that advanced training doesn't need to happen. That's my opinion. And the other point is just a is just a sidekick a point that I believe that the RP the RJ world there are a lot of people involved in it for monetary reasons and that's that's a pity. And I I want to uh, speak to that. I totally totally agree with you. And I felt that for years and years. There are and this is inevitable in social movements as they develop a lot of internal conflicts and in times monetizing what's going on. Um, to me, that's the kiss of death of this movement as a broad social movement in the international community. Um, yeah, getting reimbursed for certain expenses. Yeah, getting some kind of payment. But you know, in most of the work I've done, nearly all of the work I've done in severe violent cases, I never got a fee. And most others haven't either. Now, in some states in America, the program will, will grant some kind of stipend. It's not a lucrative fee, but the point is, um, if, if RJ gets into the point of getting so monetized, if advanced training, you know, costs this huge amount of money, whoa, uh, that raises all kinds of red flags. Be careful. Okay. And at, a, at a deeper level, advanced training can literally get in the way and interfere with deep restorative interventions that can promote healing and inner accountability. They can absolutely get in the way. It gets us totally up here in our mind and ego. It's quite a controversial line. Advanced training can do all that harm. But you also said earlier, advanced training has its place. So where do you strike a balance? Uh, not easily, Myra. I'll be very honest. Advanced, I mean, to me, the hardest kind of advanced training is what we're talking about here. Like if I did a four hour, well, on our website, our, we're now located in Duluth, Minnesota, not in the uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul area. We're doing, I'm doing a session in March. Uh, I think it's a four or five hour session on mindfulness, deep listening and stories. And it's not a full training, but it goes deeper where you have time to actually practice some of this stuff and work in smaller groups. But that kind of training is the hardest kind of training because it's working with our own minds and egos, which is hard. It is much easier to learn techniques. And then to get into the belief system, now that we have the techniques, we got it together. I, even with all the experience I've had, I am not here suggesting that I'm some expert on restorative justice that totally understands and knows exactly what to do. And I don't want you to pick that up from what I'm saying. Okay, we've got a question here from Jeff Emerson. Jeff, do you want to speak to this, please? Um, so what, what I struggle with is, is, is kind of <clears throat> respecting everybody, respecting the person uh, that you want to avoid otherizing. So um, you gave the example of your former president 
um, we've actually got a current leader who's who's <laughs> very difficult to respect and very difficult not to otherize from my personal p point of view. And it's, it's kind of very divisive. But the problem with finding people who are very divisive is that you find yourself on one side or the other. And it's kind of tempting to lob rocks rather than um, find um, common ground. And I suppose it's, it's just, it's, and I mean, that crops up in personal situations. It also crops up, crops up an awful lot in helping people who are in conflict in terms of how they can develop respect for the other person. Um, what, what are your thoughts on struggling? I mean, it's fairly basic in a way, and yet it's deeply important and very difficult. Wow. Um, no easy response to that, but a great question. The... Um, was one of the, the most powerful practices of mine to, to breathe life into mindfulness and deep listening stories is when I'm hearing former President Donald Trump speak his nonsense, his lies. It pushes every button in me. Mm. And I do not respect what he's saying and I never will, but I can learn to breathe, to slow myself, to tame my ego that buttons are getting pushed and getting very judgmental, to respect the humanity in him, the wounded child, which is behind that big man blustering and saying these awful things. And that, and then I can relate to, I mean, the fact is Donald Trump is saying things that millions of Americans want said, and he knows how to manipulate in the most brilliant way possible. And there are many, many good people who he has been able to manipulate. And unless those of us who consider ourselves progressive recognize that and listen to that and try to learn from that, we're in deep trouble. And, and everything I just said does not also exclude the fact if tomorrow morning at our state capitol in St. Paul, there was a massive demonstration against the horror of what's going on with Republicans trying to hide the insurrection that occurred in our country in January 6th, I'd be in the front line. You know, it's not either or. Uh, there's a time to get involved in direct action and there's a time to contemplate. You know, some of my greatest teachers and mentors, whether it's Gandhi or others, are examples of that. Okay, Tamara Sherwood. Thank you. Is raising her hand and would like to come in. Okay, hi. Um, so I'm, I'm here in the States in Colorado and I sit on a board, the Colorado Coalition for Restorative Justice Practices. Such an honor to be here in a circle with Mark. Um, um, and one of the things that we're really challenged with, and in Colorado, we're pretty, I, I, we have a really progressive community with restorative justice practices. And one of the challenges, well, first let me say, I think everything you talked about, this is heart work. And it's challenging to um, speak to a system that uses power over punitive measures to talk, to talk about the heart work that's involved in restorative practices or being in that position as a facilitator. Um, but I love it and it's truth. Um, and um, the practitioners here in Colorado, they really wanna know how can we evaluate and measure um, our programs, us as practitioners in, um, in being better or finding those people that aren't doing it the restorative justice way, they actually are using power over. Um, and they're wanting for us as a agency, as an organization to be those person, that person, that entity that says, yes, this is right, this is wrong. But in principle, restorative justice isn't based on that. Um, so I don't, I was just wondering what your thoughts were around that. Thank you. I have struggled with that my entire life right up to this second. Mm -hmm. um, that's my first response. The moment your um, state associations, and I've been out to Colorado a number of times and quite familiar with the incredible work you've done in your state and some of your le legislative leadership mm -hmm. on bills. Um, it's, and the work I've done with our National Association for Community and Restorative Justice, which I chaired for the first few years, we have struggled with that. 
the moment restorative justice gets into a policing function, like where state associations or national associations are almost like policing things. Are you doing it right? And if not, somehow there's some kind of sanction, even if it's just mild embarrassment, I don't know. When we get into that, that rubs against the whole spirit of restorative justice and restorative practices. What to do contrary to that? I'm not totally sure. What I, I do know having ways of encouraging and providing incentives to get deeper restorative justice planning, having peer kind of feedback and reviews that a state or national association could have a team of people to review programs. And rather than issuing a large kind of publishing, public embarrassment of some kind, uh, working with the individuals or groups in ways that are safer for them to really hear. And that there's ways of using the circle process to even do that. But the, the shortest answer I can give you is I have no simple solution to that. Uh, that is literally something I've struggled with through my entire time in this field and movement. Okay, let's see if you can come to a, a solution to the next two questions because they could be just as tricky. There's a question from Hugh Lee and a question from Amanda Wilson, which come, I think can stand together. Hugh Lee says, your talk is titled The Spiritual Not Religious Core of Restorative Justice. Please, can you expand on what you mean by spiritual rather than religious? And Amanda Wilson has put another question which says, what, if anything, distinguishes the spiritual from the ethical? So two, two questions that are probing, if you like, the, um, the words that you're using. What is spiritual over against religious? And, and what is the relationship between spiritual and ethical? Religions are based on a set of principles and dogma, a way of understanding life. And all religions have that, whether it's Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity, Judaism, Islam. And religions pass on those teachings, the understandings up here. They're very ego-loaded, particularly male ego-loaded, but not totally males by any stretch at this point in history. And spirituality, spirituality and religion kind of can overlap. For me, they overlap. Religion can provide a bridge to a deeper sense of spirituality. Spirituality is about, is, is not about dogma. It's about a way of being and honoring life, of finding a deeper meaning, of accepting what life has to offer, where things are at at this point. It's very ethical. It's based on a set of principles, not you must believe this or you're out or we'll even kill you, which has been done historically different points at a time. For many people, um, spiritual religion has not been a bridge to spirituality as it has been for me. For many people, religion, it, it, they've been too wounded physically or emotionally or even sexually by representatives of religion. And they don't need the bridge of religion. They go kind of find their own way under the bridge or around it. And they connect at a deeper level in a way that is not based on, I believe this. It's based on, I treasure this life that has been given to me by the creator I care about all of creation. It, it really embodies what the Dalai Lama has spoken about when asked, well, uh, your holiness, what is your religion based on? And he will pause and his beautiful smile will come out and he'll say, my religion is kindness. So for, again, for many people, including myself, they overlap. Um, I, I do not shun or look back on my early religious upbringing, quite conservative, um, evangelical, narrow. I don't look upon that in a bad way. It's, I, it was a good way. Literally, it introduced me some of the initial diversity of religion and cultures to me. But where I'm at now is quite a base beyond that. It's what some would call an open form of uh, Christianity. The wisdom of Jesus, this incredible rabbi, his healing wisdom, his justice ethics in no way cancels out the wisdom of, of Muhammad. 
or Buddha or many indigenous teachers, and wise folks. There's many streams that flow into the vibrant river of spirituality that pulsates through the world and life. Some of those are specific religions. Some are ethical systems. I've had people in my trainings and workshops over the years that are uh, atheists or agnostics. And they exuded what I would consider a level of deep spirituality that goes far beyond, I believe this, I must believe this. And I had some of those individuals say, this is one of the only places they felt comfortable in a circle without all of their buttons getting pushed, even talking spirituality and religion. So again, they overlap, but they're also different. Um, what I'm not saying, I'm not saying all religions are the same. They're not, they all they come out of different cultural set settings. They're different belief systems, but the core wisdom, spiritual wisdom of all religions is remarkably similar. You can look at the golden rule in the Bible and in the Quran and it's almost verbatim. So core, nobody owns core spiritual wisdom. The indigenous people of this country long before us European types and particularly white folks, it was deeply rooted in their way of being. I hope that gets it a little, again, this could be a whole workshop on this maybe, issue. Maybe I can put a plug in for you because I know that you've published a book called Restorative Justice Dialogue, An Essential Guide for Researchers and Practitioners. And there is a chapter in that book dedicated to this question yeah. um, in which you highlight what are the kind of universal principles or the core principles or elements of spirituality which lend themselves to being the ally of restorative justice. So well, I just I really, give that as a plug. I appreciate you bringing that in because that book also is, is one of the most thorough books, kind of the state of the art books on current restorative practices, justice practices and research. We put forth, identified the research that has come out to validate victim offender dialogue and conferencing and mediation, family group conferencing, community conferencing circles. So yeah. Okay, we're, we're running out of time, I'm afraid, but there's, there are more people coming in on the chat box. Um, Julia Houston, do you want to share your insight on this question of othering? Um, yeah, hi, and thank you so much. It was so inspiring, Mark and everybody, and um, I recognise what Tim was saying as well. So I was a prison chaplain in restorative justice lead for 12 years um, and worked in Cardiff prison and then um, other prisons and now in the community. And um, so I, I really recognise um, <laughs> from being within a very punitive context how easy it is to other traditional justice and restorative justice and them and us and I'm not like them and oh I wish I would you know so I recognize the othering risk I really do it's real and the harm that can be caused if we don't try to reach out for common ground which is you know what Mark responded to so I think um, I learned Shedwells recently from um, I can't remember her first name but um, her sister, she's a, a legal lead, you probably know her name in America, and I listened to her speak at uh, an international conference. Her sister was one of the Black Panthers and had horrific- Oh, Fanya, Fanya Davis. Yes, that's the lady, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yes, she was brilliant. And speaking from personal and deep personal professional experience, how she found the traditional adversarial model that's within um, you know, formal traditional justice not helpful and she tried the litigious way of bringing white people to court and, and she got no satisfaction from it. And she talks about the spirituality of indigenous peoples being lots of her inspiration for why she does. And she begins with a ritual now, even when she's doing formal speeches and she's an attorney. I mean, she's very, very legally qualified. Um, but she said very much that uh, kind of hacking away at the surface of things, as good as restorative justice meetings are, unless we have um, a reckoning about that um, inequity. So I'd just like to say, I recognize the anger about Trump and um, much the same over here at the moment. It's not my politics. I can other very easily, um, but I do think there are systemic wrongs that restorative justice needs to speak up about. We do need to, um, 
But also I think we need to call in, not to call out. We don't want to shame, otherwise we're the same. So, so what can restorative justice do around systemic change, talking about equalities and injustice in honesty? Um, and we are called to face up, I think, bravely and courageously. So, um, so, so whilst I, you know, I, I'm Roman Catholic brought up and still have some remnants of, of um, <laughs> religious faith remaining, but in the prison, we were all faiths and none. So I also recognize what Mark is saying about what we've got in common. And it's the spirituality, not the religion. It really is those core values, deep humanity, wanting the best, wanting us to flourish and not harm, I think. Um, so I don't know, I just went blah, blah. That's great. No, no, that's great. Thank you, Julia. Thank you. Um, it's five minutes past the hour, but I'm going to give one person more um, the floor if I can. Mary Lou Reeve, you've raised your hand. What would you like to say? Mary Lou? Can't hear. <laughs> Not here. Okay. Oh, so she's on mute. That made ah, me worry. Okay, Mary Lou, can you unmute, please? Okay, I think that's not going to work. Um, there have been an, a number of um, reactions to your um, comments, Mark, about payment. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that that's a conversation which is worth having in another arena about what is the appropriate levels of remuneration and recognition of professionalism that goes on in the whole restorative justice world. Um, so it's interesting that your comments have at least raised a number of questions from folks about what is, what is appropriate remuneration and, and how to recognize that. But I think we can leave it there and on behalf of everybody who's participated to thank you, Mark, for a stunning presentation and lots of food for thought. Um, I hope this will enable the Mint House Network to keep a conversation going on spirituality um, and the core elements of spirituality within restorative justice theory and practice. Um, thank you everybody for taking part and thank you again, Mark for your comments. Don't forget folks to go into the website to see the next terms program or the new year program for more network events. And you'll find on the chat box, lots of information arising about publications um, relating to what Mark's been doing. So take a look at that as well. Thank you, Mark, very much indeed. Thank you. Cheers.